Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we are in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 4 and 5 this lesson, maybe touching on verse 6. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, as we see here in verse 4, we're, we're actually dealing in, remember, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 deal with the qualifications of being a bishop. So we're dealing, we're, we're looking at these qualifications now. And he says, well, we saw last lesson in verse 3, that a bishop is not to be given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous. And now we get into verses 4 and 5. And verses 4 and 5 have been a source to some Christians. It has, they have been a source of great condemnation. Uh, let's read verse 4. It says here, one that rules his well, his, his, run that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Verse 5 says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, Christians, they, again, this has been a kind of a, stumbling block to some Christians because they look at this and they say, well, my house isn't that way, all right? And they don't think that they have an upright home that these verses require. And it doesn't matter whether they're, this Christian is going for an office in the church or not. They read these verses on their own and they say to themselves, well, maybe <laughs> I'm glad I'm not, I'm glad I'm not going for an office in the church because my house isn't, isn't, uh, up to snuff like these verses say. But, uh, let's look at verse four and a little, a little more closely. And then we're going to take a look at verse five and let, let's see what they say. The first thing we see is that it would seem that verse 4 is implying that a bishop has to be married. All right, it says here, one that rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And it seems to imply, again, that a bishop has to be married. But as we saw back in verse 2, that this is not the case. A bishop doesn't have to be married in order to be a bishop. Another implication that is given is that if a bishop is married and if the bishop has children, then the children should be God-fearing, Bible-believing children. Right? It says, uh, one that fears rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And the implication is that if you have, if you're married and you do have children, then those children are going to be, are going to be Christians and Bible believing, God loving, praying children. But this is, and this is also not true. This is not what it's saying. Each person, each person, even children, are accountable to God themselves. And we cannot force anyone to get saved. There are many pastors in the world today who have children that are not believers. I can't save anybody. God, listen, regardless of what you may think or what other people may think, we cannot save anybody, all right? Salvation is, is not in my grasp. I mean, if, if I could save someone, 
I would save them. I would save all people. But I don't have the ability to save anyone. Now, I do have the ability to be a testimony and to lead people and to teach people about God. But concerning salvation, no one has that power to save anybody. That's only in, in God's hands, right? Paul said, right? One person waters, another person, uh, one person plants, another waters. But who gives the growth? It's God. You can take that seed and plant it in the ground. Somebody can water it. But only God is the one who makes it germinate, right? I, I can't do that. I can't make it. I can't make it become a plant and grow. Same thing. It, it's not in us to, uh, to, to save someone. I can't make someone be saved, right? I remember years ago, many years ago, I was working at a job and Christian friend of mine, he has had children and, and the children were, were, were young, but maybe a little bit, uh, they were just regular children, but we worked, <laughs> we worked with another person and he, he was, he was in a denominational church. I don't know if he was saved or not, but he was in a denominational church and he had older children, teenage children. And they, of course, were upright, nice children and so on and so forth. And, you know, this, this, uh, religious guy was somewhat, you know, looked down upon my friend, my Christian friend who had children and, uh, was, was a, a, a good man of God. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, uh, it just, you know, the, the, the righteous, the, 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 sometimes the righteous people can be mocked by the unrighteous. They, they, you know, this, this family here has a, a good model home, you know, a model home where the children are good and everything. And, and this person who's a Christian, he may have children that are a little, little wild, you know, <laughs> and, and the thing, and, and then this person, this, this father can somewhat look down or mockingly at this father here and say, well, what's wrong with you? You know, you're, you're not the model Christian. You preach and yet your children, look at your children. You know, you must not be a good father or good parents, you know, that kind of thing. And so this is kind of the implication that that's given here. What verse four does say, what it does say is that the children whether they're saved or not saved, should be obedient and respectful. And that's what it's saying. It says here, verse 4, the bishop is one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection. doesn't say that they have to be saved because a bishop doesn't matter. We can't, the, the, the father cannot save the children. The father can be an example and preach and teach. Now, I know there's denominations out there that unless, you know, unless your children are saved, you can't even be a deacon in our church, right? <laughs> unless you can prove your children are saved, you can't, you can't ever be a pastor in our denomination unless your kids are saved, right? Well, that's bondage. That's bondage. And it's not, that's not right teaching because no one has the power to save anybody. All right. Why is it why is it important that the candidate for being an overseer, a bishop, order his, his house well and have obedient and respectful children? All right. Why why is verse 4 important? The reason, the answer is verse 5. And verse 5 says for a man, for if a man does not know how to rule his house, then how shall he take care of the church of God? Right? The most important phrase in this verse, verse 5, is knows not how to rule. It says here, verse 5, for if a man, what? Know not how to rule. That's the key. Know not how to rule. You know, there are many people who do rule, they rule a church, they rule a Bible study, they rule prayer meetings, they rule uh, whatever, they rule the song service, 
but they don't know how to do it well. We, there, there's churches are, are full of people who like to rule, but that doesn't mean they do it well. Some people have ideas of how to build a house, but there are only other people who actually have done it and know how to do it. You know, I can go home and I can, I can, in, in my imagination, I can imagine building a wonderful house and putting it together and all that stuff. <laughs> but I've never done it. I don't even know if my, if what I imagine is, is correct, right? You know, uh, I can imagine building the frame and, you know, putting the plumbing in and electrical, but I don't know. Maybe the electric goes first and then the plumbing. Maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. But there are people out there who do know how to build a house. I don't. I can imagine it. Then there are people in the church who, you know, they like ruling. They, they imagine ruling, but they don't know really how to rule. The on-the-job experience of ruling his own house gets him ready to govern the spiritual lives of the congregation. And that's what he's saying here. Verse 4, one that rules his own house well. Why? Why Why is it important that the bishop knows how to rule his own house if he has a house, if he has a wife and children? Why is it important? Why? Verse 5, for if he, if he doesn't know how to rule his own house, how, how can he take care of the church of God? This seems to be the progression of, of Christian devotion. Our first devotion is to God. And our second devotion is to family. And our third devotion is then to the church. Right? God first, family second, church third. And if you can't rule the family right, then you can't, you're not going to be able to rule the congregation, the church right. And that's what he's saying there. Now, verse 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, he says not a novice. And of course, the Greek word is neophutos, neophutos. And neos means new, and phu means to bring forth or to produce, to produce something new, to bring forth something new. So it means newly planted, a new convert, someone who has been born into the family of God, all right? It means someone who's inexperienced, like a newborn babe, okay? It's a new Christian. So he says, not a novice, lest being lifted up. Lifted up here is the next phrase, and this Greek word is tufao, tufao, and it means a smoke or a mist, a rising mist, like a humidity or like, like a, a fog, a mist or a smoke coming up, all right? And the purpose is to blind something. So it means to blind by use of smoke or or uh, or a mist. So he says here, not a, a bishop should not be someone who's a new Christian born into the family of God, lest being lifted up, lest there become a smoke screen, a, a mist in front of them, all right, blinding them. Not only is the novice himself blinded by this mist, but also some Christians can be blinded also. They get blinded. How do the other Christians get blinded? They get blinded because he is young and energetic. They, the other Christians see this new, newborn Christian and he's young and he's handsome and he's got lots of energy. He's excited about the Lord. Right. And they and the congregation gets gets blinded. They get smoked. All right. They get they get fogged out. They, they can't see. But the problem, the problem is that he isn't tested and he's try isn't tried yet. Many times I've spoken on it. I'll speak it again. Is that too many times Christians see 
famous people, famous uh, musicians or famous singers or whatever, politicians or whoever they are, somebody well known and they get saved, right? And all of a sudden they say, oh, you're a famous actor, act for Jesus, right? Or you're a famous musician, oh, you need to start playing for Jesus right now, right? Or you're a famous, you're a well-known, you're a well-treasure uh, banker in our community. Oh, we need you to take care of the church's finances, right? As soon as they get saved, oh, amazing, they got saved? Well, let's get them right into the church and get them going, right? <laughs> and 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 Christians are, are notorious for doing that, for getting people in and, and putting them, wanting to put them in a position, right? And, and I'm telling you, the, the, the first thing, the most important thing that a newborn person needs, a new Christian needs, is to sit and do nothing but listen to the Word of God. Sit and hear the Word of God at least for a year. Don't do anything for a year. Get them in, sit them in a pew. Don't ask them to do anything. They need the Word of God. They need to hear the Word of God. And they need to be trained in it and, and to grow in the word of God. They don't need to be pushed into singing, singing around the community. They don't need to be pushed into whatever, acting for Jesus and making movies and things. No, they need to sit in and hear the word of God, the truth of the word of God. All right, we're going to finish there and then we'll continue on next lesson. Until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.